Attention all personnel. Incoming podcast. This is MASH Matters. Hello and welcome to MASH Matters, the podcast celebrating the greatest television show of all time, MASH. And here's a fellow who was on MASH. Jeff Maxwell. Hello, Jeff. Hello, Ryan Patrick. I am very happy to be here because I was on a wonderful television show called MASH, and we're doing a wonderful podcast about MASH called MASH Matters. And boy, do we have a terrific show today. Yeah, this is the first time that we've had two people joining us here on the podcast. Yeah. Without further ado, let's introduce our special guest, Jeff. Here's our conversation with two terrific people, Ken Levine and David Isaacs. Okay, so just in case nobody knows who we're actually talking to today, I'm going to give you a little introduction and history. Not going to mention all our guests' credits or we will miss dinner. Our special guests are Emmy Award winning writers David Isaacs and Ken Levine. As a writing team, they are responsible for creating and or writing little shows like The Simpsons, The Tony Randall Show, The Jeffersons, Becker, Everybody Loves Raymond, Almost Perfect, Wings, Mary, Big Wave, Dave's, Cheers, Frasier, and that wacky little show about doctors in Korea, MASH. Ken also has a successful career as a television director. He's authored four books, including The Me Generation by Me, Must Kill TV, It's Gone, No, Wait a Minute, Talking My Way into the Big Leagues at 40, and Where the Hell Am I? Trips I Have Survived. He's written and produced numerous stage plays. He has a daily blog where he discusses all facets of showbiz and life, and he hosts his own terrific podcast. And David uh, opened a balloon store in West Hollywood, which is a wonderful, (laughs) wonderful place. I recommend going in there anytime you need a balloon. No, no, no. Okay. David is the reason I have pants on today. Because David has not only done all those wonderful writing assignments, he's also a tenured professor of screen and television writing at the University of Southern California in Southern California. So Ken and David, welcome to MASH Matters. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. And thanks for the plug on the balloon store. We're um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> inflated is just killing it on Melrose. I know. <laughs> Inflation is really rough for you, isn't it? Yikes. So, hey, guys, thank you very much. Uh, We love you for showing up. Uh, We've had a, uh, Ryan and I are are really enjoying doing our podcast. We've been doing it over a little, little over two years. And uh, we've had some, uh, the cast of MASH on, which was really, really fun. You had the cast on before us? (laughs) Well, it's just, you know. Really? (laughs) That Alan Alda guy, he wouldn't, he just bugged us until we let him on. Yeah. You know, let's kind of start back at the beginning real quickly. I know you guys met uh, in the Army Reserves. That's right. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And uh, you were two young whippersnappers in the Army Reserves having fun. What was it like being in the Army Reserves? Uh, I don't know. For me, I... I always looked good in the uniform, so <laughs> I enlisted just because I knew how, how damn good I'd look. Yeah, yeah. It was mash without the snipers. <laughs> <laughs> it was mash without the snipers, yeah. We were sort of out of place, you would say, but we were also, we met in a unit, in a particular unit that was populated by a lot of talented people uh, who were out of radio and journalism and TV journalism. Remember Joel Siegel, who was on ABC, mm-hmm. did movie reviews. Mm-hmm. He was a member. We had uh, Pat Kelly, who was Machine Gun Kelly, who was a disc jockey in L.A. Yeah. Of course, Ken was a disc jockey as well. Mm-hmm. Yes. So we were kind of an entertainment. Um, well, the, our actual uh, unit was the 222nd Public Information Detachment, or as Arnaud Daguerre, of course, was the Fighting Two Double Deuce. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, we were we were basically armed forces radio. It was armed forces. Yeah. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, if they called us up, then man, you're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they called us up and we're doing good morning Vietnam. Yeah. We're in trouble. We're basically over there to hum the hits. That that's yep. what we're doing. But we, you know, two guys, you know, we met in the barracks in Fort Carson, Colorado, and uh, we just sort of hit it off. You know, I, I was reading a book about George S. Kaufman the playwright, which is not something you normally see in any barracks. Right. <laughs> Just seeing anybody read a book. Yeah. 
Who's that guy with a book over there? Wow. You know, after the other guys threw a blanket over me, beat the shit out of me, Ken <laughs> said, you know, I noticed you were reading a book. And uh, I said, yes. And I flinched for yeah, a second, flinched. but he, he <laughs> asked me questions. So you, you had a little conversation and it was a decent friendship from that point on then. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. I mean, we had both talked about wanting to to write. At the time, I was an all-night disc jockey in San Bernardino, and uh, David was working at ABC in the long since obsolete uh, film department. And then I quickly got fired uh, when I got off a of summer camp and came back to live with my parents in LA while I tried to get another radio job. And I called David and said, hey, you want to write a script together? And um, we met in October of 1973, and we have been partners ever since. Wow. Wow. Longer than uh, many marriages in Los Angeles. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. More than one or two. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, a you know, if you write as long as we did or if you write successfully, it's you know, it is like a marriage, you know, it is except with this guy it was sex, sex, sex all the time. Yeah. It's so, <laughs> such a shame. So you guys are, are in this unit and you're talking and you're, you can share the fact that you both read books and that's something to do, but both of you were both of you sort of bubbling up in terms of that you were funny. Uh, I'm always interested in how the heck somebody discovers they're funny. And and how they then express it, what they do with it. And Ken, you were a disc jockey, so you certainly had a you had a platform for it. I I guess right. Yeah, I was I was kind of Howard Stern before Howard Stern, mm -hmm. and I would get fired, and you know all the program directors would keep telling me, just shut up and play the records. You're not funny. <laughs> and and I remember going to um, a movie theater and seeing Sleep, the Woody Allen movie. And it was like a light bulb went over my head, like, well, wait a minute, this guy is like writing this movie and he can do visual gags and there's the actual audience. He can hear laugh when you're on the radio. You never hear anybody laugh. Yeah. You know, uh, he's probably making a whole lot more money and he's not working in the middle of the night in a cow pasture <laughs> in San Bernardino. It's like, hmm. Maybe I better rethink this disc jockey thing. <laughs> yeah. And David, what was your uh, oh moment in terms of being funny? Uh, and one of the reasons that Ken and I bonded is I had the same oh moment with a different movie. I saw Woody Allen's Take the Money and Run. And I remember sitting in the theater alone and just thinking, this is the funniest thing I've ever seen. And could, you know, if, 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 if there was a way to do this for a living or how do I learn to do this or how do I start writing or what do I do? And, you know, it's kind of the stuff you tuck away for a while to get kind of figure out how you do it. And so for me, I grew up on the East coast. So I had to come in this direction. It was either go to New York or go to LA and I wanted to come to LA. So uh, I was lucky enough to meet Ken and, you know, I, I guess those things are faded. We just, the minute we started talking together, it was like we had the same kind of sensibility and the same heroes and, had read the same books and it seemed like it was a no brainer. We should just try to do this together. And neither of us had any real training. So we were really at the same level yeah. mm -hmm. in terms of our learning and, and our growth. Yeah. There was a real comfort level with each other then nobody was, you know, smarter than the other guy and, you know, feeling uncomfortable about that. No, if anything, I thought I should have somebody smart with me. So I can <laughs> be really yeah. good at this. Well, yeah. <laughs> So how did you go from the Army Reserves to writing about the Army with MASH? What was that path? Well, we started out by writing uh, scripts on spec. We wrote a pilot. Uh, we wrote a Mary Tyler Moore show that got rejected, a Rhoda that got rejected. And then my mom was playing golf one day with the story editor of the Jeffersons, Gordon Mitchell. And, you know, good Jewish mother said, oh, my son is a writer. <laughs> and he said, OK, just have him send a script. And if I like it, we'll get in touch. And so I did. And they liked the script and invited us to pitch a Jefferson's. And we did. And we uh, we sold a Jefferson's. That was our first. And then we basically did freelance. We did a couple of episodes of Joe and Sons. 
show that is probably one of the five classic TV sitcoms of all time. <laughs> uh, we we did some stories for Barney Miller, uh. and uh, eventually our agent was at the same agency as Gene Reynolds, who was the showrunner of MASH. And um, Gene was looking for young writers because it was, again, everything is, you know, luck. Uh, this was season five and Larry Gelbart had left after season four. And Larry did 90% of the writing the first four years. So they were looking for young people and we were pitched and uh, Gene liked our Jeffersons. And so we came in and we pitched MASH and we got a MASH assignment and that pretty much launched our career. But I'm sure David would agree that had we not had that experience in the army, that we really couldn't write that show, certainly not with any real authority. I mean, we were very young at the time, we're like 26. Mm -hmm. And we still felt confident because we knew that world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we sort of knew the ambiance, I guess is the way you would describe us. We could write it feeling like we knew how those people talked, or certainly people in authority talked in the army. The logic, the crazy logic. And then I think we identified with the fact of being trapped in <laughs> in a place, yeah. mm -hmm. thankfully not in, in the midst of a, of a war with people dying around you, but but at least the idea of being in a place where we didn't feel like we fit. So just that kind of general feeling, I think, helped us along. And of course, working with Gene and, and, Bert, and Bert Medcalf and and being inspired by Gelbart. I mean, Gelbart mm -hmm. to us is like like Woody Allen was yeah. Yeah. in terms of the hero and in terms of his style and his use of language. And anyone will tell you who wrote on that show, we, we were all chasing Larry. We were all trying to write that Gelbart style, but only Larry really could do it in a kind of Mozartian way, I guess. Yeah, you were both young guys in the army. Mm -hmm. I assume you didn't, you hadn't gone, <laughs> you're a professor of, of writing at USC, and Ken, you've taught writing as well, but you didn't have a teacher while you were in the army, and nor did you go to one afterwards. So, no, here's basically how we learned. Uh, we wanted to write a spec Mary Tyler Moore show. And back in those days, the only way to watch a show is to see it when it aired. Mm -hmm. So that was Saturday night at nine o'clock. And what we would do was watch the show and hold up a microphone <laughs> to the speaker and record it, <laughs> then go back and write a detailed outline of the show. And we did that week after week after week until eventually we started seeing the patterns and we started figuring out how they assembled these shows and what elements they used and when they used them, et cetera, et cetera. So we basically learned the Mary Tyler Moore show by watching the Mary Tyler Moore show. Yeah, it was on, if you remember, it was on Saturday nights. It was all comedy that night. And as hard as it is to believe, neither one of us had a very rich love life at that time. So we... Uh, I was getting laid today. I'd probably, you know, morning disc jockey in Houston. And uh, so we just, that was our Saturday night, wow. we, we, which was a treat for us because we were trying to write it. And as Ken said, we would record it, the audio. And somehow in a strange way, it was better that way because you would key in on the dialogue and mm -hmm. you're not yeah. as distracted by the, f the funny moving pictures, yeah. but it, it was a way to kind of listen to it and kind of key in on it more. But we studied really hard in that way. And we kept at it all the time. We Every weekend we wrote, and then we try to get together about two or three nights a week just to keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. Wow! Luckily mm -hmm. I worked at ABC so we could use an office there in the old Talmadge studio, uh, the prospect and Talmadge in East Hollywood. So we, we had a place to write at night yeah. and we'd get grab something to eat. It, was, Fun. it wasn't bad. It was a couple of years of just trying to get ahead like that. Yeah. You're really self-taught. I mean, that's a pretty astonishing thing to do. I mean, especially now at schools, you can get, uh, you know, you get DVDs, you go online and people teach you how to do things. You were out there kind of in the middle of nowhere trying to figure it out. 
piecing it together as you went. That's that's pretty extraordinary. And then going from that to sitting with Gene Reynolds, <laughs> a guy who has more yeah. experience, you know, than anybody. Yeah, we learned so much from Gene of all of our mentors, and we've been blessed to have great mentors. But I don't think we learned more from anybody than we did from Gene Reynolds. Yeah. We, we learned really how to write, how to tell stories, the importance of humanity. We learned so much from Gene Reynolds. Can you give us one thing that he kind of said that stuck with you, just kind of one idea or concept that helped you? What I think we learned most from Gene, because I'd never seen anybody sort of break down a story before. And we used to meet him at his house up in the Hollywood Hills and, and we would send ahead the, the outlines. And then we watched Gene sort of take it apart. But always what Gene was, it had to have a point to it. It couldn't just be a series of funny scenes or something where you get to a, a dramatic moment in the show. You had to earn that. Things had to be set up well. And as much as we had studied, we didn't think of it that way. So when Ken says that he had the greatest influence on us, and we did, I'll, I'll second what Ken said about us having amazing mentors and people we wrote with and wrote for, no one had the kind of initial impact on us that Gene did. And the things that started to make sense more as we got better and better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At first, you're kind of like, I'll never get this. And then you, you just start to, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, Gene taught us that the audience needs to care. You know, they need to care. It, it can't just be a funny story. You know, whatever problems the characters are going through, you had to be empathetic. You you really had to care about them. And Gene, and it, and also he was a director, so he dealt with actors all the time. But really preserving the integrity and the dignity of the characters was so important. To Gene. Yeah. Except for Igor. <laughs> I <was gonna laughs> say that. Well, <laughs> all right. So, yeah, I guess everybody failed there, but that's all right. I'm I fine. I think if I remember, the thing I remember that Gene would always say about Igor was, why is he in this scene? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I remember correctly. I uh, can uh, take him out. Right. Take him out. Yeah. And we, we, no, we said no. We got to nah, nah, we all love Jeff. He I know. I brought the balloons. You know, what the hell? You know, he's got a big <laughs> fan base. <laughs> In his own. He's the reason people watch. Exactly. Hey, you know, the ratings were not good the first uh, season or so. And when I came on the show, they bolted up. I'm telling you. So, I, you know, yeah, no, hey, the, come on. The fact that they moved you from Sunday to Saturday uh, <laughs> in between All in the Family and the Mary Tyler Moore show, that had nothing to do with it. Not a it thing. Was, it was adding Jeff Maxwell Absolutely. to the cast. Thank you very much. I, I believe in the former theory. I believe it was when Jeff hit the ground that the show really yep. took off. <laughs> Thank you. Straw that stirred the drink. It's, it's <laughs> probably not the balloons, I guess. Yeah. Well, you were talking about, you know, so that everybody cares about the character uh, and is empathetic. That's kind of a tough thing when you got a character like Frank Burns. You know, that's that took a great deal of skill to build in our empathy for that kind of character. You know, it's true. But what we also tried to point out with Frank Burns was just a sort of sadness of this guy's life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what is the key to writing for a character like Frank, you know, a, a character that you don't relate to on a personal level? You have to find the reason why that character behaves the way they do. Fear is a big motivator in comedy. You know, Frank is probably his, his fear of, of being found out, fear, feeling less than. And so he builds up his importance. And so suddenly you have this guy who's uh, sort of relies on authority. And he, that makes him kind of a, an easy target for Hawkeye and Trapper or Hawkeye and DJ. So, you know, you think that you have to think that way. You have to kind of put yourself in the shoes that way. Why is he doing the things he's doing? I think it also has more to do with if characters have a lot of faults, they're easier to write. Hmm. Yeah. The character is vain. If a character is is a liar, if a character is cheap, it's much easier to mine comedy from those characters than somebody who is, you know, very sweet and yeah. always nice. Give me give me a flaw, you know, give me mm -hmm. a flaw, mm -hmm. you know. Tell me 10 things about this person and they better not be all loyal, friendly, happy, good-natured, <laughs> right. generous, 
you know, uh-huh. what am I writing? Igor. Yeah, you were just talking about me. Writing I Igor. <laughs> <You're> writing Igor. <laughs> Well, if if you're uh, in terms of writing for an actor, you know, we all feel closer to various people, you know, at various times and who we meet or is it easier to write for a, a character when you have a certain resonance with the actor? Or does it matter? When you say resonance with the actor, what do you, what do you mean? Well, a certain feeling. Uh, I don't want to say friendship because not everybody gets really friendly on those sets. But if you have a certain affinity for an actor as opposed to another, yeah. oh. is their character a little easier to write for than the one that you don't have that feeling with? Yeah, there is. It's not on MASH, but there's a, a character actor named Chip Zion and he was a regular on Almost Perfect, and he's done 13 Broadway shows. Uh, he was in Into the Woods and everything. But I just channeled this guy. <laughs> this guy is just like in my voice, <laughs> and I will pitch lines that he will just nail. So I tend to write for that kind of character, and I'm always looking for someone as good as Chip who can actually do it. Some some characters, you just have a kind of natural idea for i mean i I loved writing clinger stuff because i just i just got the desperation you know (laughs) i guess so so my mind went there ken for some reason not that he's from otumwa iowa or he was a clerk in the in the army but he could channel radar i mean yeah i just tuned into radar he could like twist the syntax on the first time and i go that's the right way to say it that's perfect yeah and nurse bigelow I was the voice of Nurse Bigelow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Speaking of Radar, real quick, I want to bring up one episode in particular, which was Radar's last episodes, the, the two-parter, Goodbye Radar. Something that, that Jeff and I have discussed on the podcast, I, I was surprised at the edge that Radar had, the, uh, almost anger. Mm-hmm. And I was curious if that was... In the writing, or was that a choice of Gary Berghoff's? No, that was the actor's interpretation of it. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, he made that choice. I assume that's not exactly what you had in mind when you were writing it then? No, even to the point of he didn't want to wear his hat. <laughs> and our thought is, well, then you're going to look like you're 35 mm-hmm. yeah. if you're not wearing the hat. I think he had some idea in his mind that his character had evolved. And, may- and maybe... You know, to his credit, maybe he was right in the sense of, in his mind, playing the character, and he's the one that has to do it, that that it had to be that way. We didn't necessarily see it that way. But in the end, when he leaves the teddy bear, it kind of proves it out. So yeah. mm-hmm. he has moved yeah. on. Well, if you have, a, if you have a, a difference of, of opinion, a different perspective about how the, how the role is being played that you've written, and the actor is saying, no, I'm going to do it this way, I'm going to do it with an edge, I'm going to do it a little angry, and you've written it completely the other way. Is that a tough moment, uh, you know, to deal with? Yeah. You know, there's some fights you're just not going to win. And we were just the writers. We we didn't even direct it. You know, I think if, if I was directing the episode, there would be longer conversations about that. You know, as a writer, you can kind of offer your opinion, but that's, that's pretty much it. Mm-hmm. I mean, look, even... In the case of, of how Hot Lips changed mm-hmm. over the years, and we would talk a lot in the room about, and, and I, you know, this is Loretta's choice to, and she's, you know, was great in the part. She owned it, but she started to glamorize a little bit. And we would, you know, you never saw her in fatigues anymore. You'd see in her black sweater. And and, and you can watch the show in the girl bar years and then watch it, watch her evolve. And I, once again, I understand that a character evolves and it, and a actor playing the characters sees it that way. But we we thought it seems too glamorous for the reality of this. But, you know, none of us are going to go up there and have that discussion with with Loretta. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> she was wearing these like olive drab custom T-shirts that said <laughs> mash on them, which <laughs> certainly did not exist. And yeah. she had long fingernails. It's like what surgical nurse has long fingernails? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. She's probably going to listen to this and go, I knew I should have killed those two no talent bastards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Back then. 
No, it was just a, it was just a no. Never had a problem with the betrayal. It was just the, the decorative part of it. You know. Yeah. Another episode that you two wrote that is a particular favorite of mine and many Mash fans is Point of View. Mm-hmm. I, I'm curious not only about the genesis of that story, where that idea came from, to do it from the soldier's point of view. From a technical standpoint, that was a drastic change from the norm. Is that something when you when you write something like that? Do you have to talk to the cinematographer? And, and say, can this even happen? Or is it one of those instances where you just write it and ask forgiveness? <laughs> we just, in this case, we just wrote it and figured, okay, director magic. And so much of the credit of the success of that show, I would say 70% goes to Charles Dubin, who directed it. He did such a magnificent job. And you have to remember too, back in those days, which was like 1977, 1978, they didn't have handheld cameras. No. You know, he had this, this big honking camera <laughs> yeah. and to negotiate all of that and to put it in helicopters and and everywhere else with a, a time limit of days. You know, we only have so many days to, to shoot this. He did a an absolutely magnificent job. The trick in that, which we didn't think of until we watched some point of view movies, some subjective camera movies, the particular one was Lady in the Lake, which is a Robert Montgomery, Philip Marlowe film where the camera is Philip Marlowe. And the only time you see him is if he's looking in a mirror with somebody. And we watched that. And what struck us was how boring it was when the characters just talked to the camera while he talked back to them. So there was no sort of motion to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So they're listening and then they're talking and we thought that's super boring. (laughs) So I don't know who it was, might've been Ken or Bert. I don't remember, but somebody said we should not have the patient talk. That way everybody can just be talking to the camera. And so that's the wind he had was was being shot in the, or having shrapnel in his throat so he couldn't talk. And that eliminated the fact that he had to talk back to them. Great idea. <laughs> and, and that was that was a that was a big get for us. Yeah. We could have done it the other way and found it intensely boring. Yeah. So much collaboration was going. Did you have that sense on MASH, uh, you know, with tremendous collaboration between everybody, producers, writers, actors and so forth? Um, it, was it any different than other shows that you've been on before? Um, there have been shows that have been less collaborative. For the most part, we've been very lucky in that we've been on some very good shows. But I think the key to MASH, you know, most of these shows really take their cue from the star. Mm-hmm. And uh, in this case, Alan Alda was very supportive. He was always a cheerleader. He was always very positive. He was very respectful. So it made the collaboration very easy. It really did. Mm-hmm. He, he, he really, he was the leader in that sense, which, which is always great when you have an ensemble show and, and the star takes the mantle and is both leading and generous and of course, talented in his own right. Because he'd bring things to it that you weren't thinking of when you wrote it. And he would just enhance it that way as an actor. Uh, you know, we we would go over the script many times before it went to the table. And then at the table, we would talk about it. You know that, Jeff, that we would go back over it after it was read and discuss it. And and that's the that's the tone that Larry and Gene set right away with Alan. And the, and the script was, that was what they were going to do, you know. Things have changed a lot. You know, sometimes things are much more improvised now. But the respect for Larry's writing set such a tone of that the script was the script and we're just all going to make it better yeah. and work it. It, it, it. it was so great to be around people who were kind of grownups. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and very insightful grownups. And we were the kids. You, yeah. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> insightful and elegant people, you know. Oh, totally. That's a great way to describe them. Two, two great ways yeah. to describe that group. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was a wonderful experience for me. I was a goofball kid, came out of, you know, I was running around in nightclubs with my partner and I had no idea what I was stepping into. I mean, I knew there were movies made and kind of how they were made. But 
I had no real sense or experience on a set. So when I got there and watched all this happen, I was pretty impressed. And then when I began to recognize how good it was <laughs> and what a wonderful place it was for me to be and grow in, because I did grow up there. I was there on there for nine years and I did grow up and learn a great deal. So yeah, being around those kinds of people and you and the incredibly talented people that just covered that whole show was really a remarkable experience. Well, you also were conscious of the fact that in a time where there's some really great comedies, and we've mentioned the Mary Tyler Moore show and that and it was all in the family and the odd couple and Maud and even the even the sort of more trivial stuff was was good, you know, happy days and things like that of the time. But there was some really sharp, great writing. And still you knew that this show was by itself. There was nothing quite like it. It was dealing with something that was on its own unique. So we were always conscious of how special, how lucky we were to be a part of something so uniquely um, timeless mm -hmm. of its time. And, and it, to this day, it, it still remains a favorite of people. So we were lucky, you know. Yeah, we were. So after MASH, you go to after MASH. Oh, never say that word. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said it. I said it. I, I'm going there. I'm just curious about your general thoughts. It lasted two seasons, but of course it never did come out of the shadow of MASH. Why do you think it couldn't capture that same magic? I think the premise just, uh, you know, a comedy set in a stateside veterans administration hospital <laughs> is not probably the the best idea. <laughs> I will say this though, Larry Gelbart created it and came back. And what drew us to the project was being able to spend a year or more working hand in hand with Larry Gelbart. Yeah. yeah. Boy, I, yeah. I treasure that. I, I would write Webster. <laughs> I, I would write any show to have that opportunity. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I wouldn't have traded the experience. I mean, it wasn't successful and it was in a, you know, it lost its audience immediately, almost within a couple of weeks. People were like, this is not for me. And we probably didn't attack it. I mean, we, if we were going to do something like that, we probably should have done it in a completely different way. We should have been much more cautious about who was going to take us through the show because we were taking three of the supporting characters from the old show. Uh -huh. uh, but we needed someone to drive it in a sense, yeah. as great as those people were. But we never thought of it that way. We, we, we just kind of wrote it. But I wouldn't trade the experience because we got to hang out with Larry. Sure. Which was learning and fun. I would say it was like being on a basketball court with Magic Johnson. Oh, he would make great. you better. Yeah. He would put. Yeah. He would set you up. Like Magic would find you in the uh, exact best place for you uh, to get the ball, and that was Larry working with Larry. You were so inspired, and Larry was so good at kind of giving everyone what they needed that yeah. never would have traded that, even if the show wasn't a success. I thought you did write Webster, Ken. I thought that, that wasn't. I didn't read Webster. I swear, I <laughs> that was Daniel Webster. Oh, Daniel Webster. Okay. <laughs> How many shows, how many MASH episodes did you guys write? 19 or 20. I'm, I'm not sure. 19 or 20. That were ours, yeah, that we wrote. And we rewrote a lot. Yeah, because you were not just uh, writers, but there was story editing and... We were essentially the head writers. Yeah. How much uncredited work did you do? <laughs> uh, well, you could say we did a lot of uncredited work. Mm -hmm. You know how it is on television. You share the credit and you, you might have written a good portion of the episode, but the, the author gets the credit. And that's been true for us sometimes as well. You know, we things got rewritten and and uh, and we got credit. But it was Ken and myself and uh, pretty much Ronnie Graham and Bert. And then we added Larry Balmasia, a very small staff. It was just basically us. Um, and Alan, of course, contributed to the writing as well. But uh, it was very small compared to these days. It, it was a small group. So we did a lot. We wrote every outline. We wrote every script. Our thumbprints are on pretty much everything. Yeah. From the years we were there from. Yeah. Well, we wrote in the fifth year, but not on staff. And then we were six, seven. And then we wrote, we said goodbye with the goodbye Raider episode in the beginning of the eighth season. So why did you decide to leave the show? Because we had done every hot show, every cold show, every visiting general, everyone had slept with everyone else. <laughs> every leisure time activity had been interrupted by choppers. You know, the problem with MASH is you're just locked into a place and time. And with other sitcoms, 
characters can marry, they can have babies, they can change apartments, you can do things. But we were sort of locked in this time and space. And um, I think the combination of not really thinking there's that much more to do with these characters, and also uh, a lot of the stories came from interviews from uh, doctors and nurses and corpsmen and people who had been in MASH units. Mm -hmm. Over seven seasons, we had picked those bones pretty clean. And as you know, we would do two or three different stories every episode. And uh, we just felt like, you know what, I I think we've said all that that we can say. Mm. I I could sum it up for you in in one sentence, the which kind of says what Ken just said. The, the the war itself, the Korean War, lasted three years. The series lasted eleven years. Yeah, yeah. So it was just time for us to move on and for fresher eyes to get in there. And the show was changing a little bit in terms of its style. And mm-hmm. but and we wanted to get on. We were you know we were getting offers to do other things. We wanted to write movies, which we hadn't had a chance to do yet. So we were kind of we had a lot to do that we we wanted to do. It seemed like the right time. I remember uh, Larry Gelbart was standing there one day on the set and. I I heard that he was leaving and I walked over to him and I said, Larry, why are you leaving? And he said, I'm tired. (laughs) That was it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we used to have a board and we would fill in all of the, the stories. And uh, by the end of the season, you had all these stories and subplots and things like that. And it was like on a big, you know, whiteboard. And I remember at the end of the season, just taking a rag and wiping it clean and going, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, to, to look at that board anytime you're on a show, regardless of the show. And in those days, you did 22 or 24. If you were a successful show, you did 24, sometimes 26. Yeah, we did 25 every year. We did 25. And you'd come in and look at that board and you'd go, oh, my God. And we'd say to the, you know, as to say to young writers on other shows, and I'd say, some of you are not going to make it off this island, you know, <laughs> and this is a long campaign. This yeah. is like, you got to fill that board and it's not easy. How they used to do it in the old days in the fifties and they do 39. Episodes. Yeah, I know. To oh. this day. I, yeah. Ah. I just don't think they, they did the rewriting. No, the, no. The way we all did. You know, I, I'd say, you know, I'm tired. Let, let Ricky Ricardo sing Cuban beat again. In this <laughs> uh, yeah. But, and they're all dead anyway. So see what did. it does to you, for God's sake. I used to say, oh, that's how they did it. They yeah. Ricky sing a song. Yeah. The, you know, people listening to MASH, they turn on the thing and they look at the show and they look at an episode and you go, wow, and it's 26 minutes or whatever it is. I don't think anybody has a sense of actually how that episode showed up. So taking one episode, can you just briefly run us through how that episode shows up from beginning to end? Okay, well, probably starts at least one of the stories would start from the research. We would find something and find a way of using our characters. And then we would try to find a complementary story. And if one was comedic, we would try to find one that was a little more dramatic and find a way for the two to dovetail And then we would plot out the stories. And usually MASH had five scenes in each act. And oftentimes you would deal with both stories in the same scene. But if you go back, there's pretty much five basic scenes in act one and five basic scenes in act two. Then we write the script. Then it gets polished. It gets sent down to be printed. Then the actors arrive. And uh, there was only a a four-day schedule on on MASH. The first day, we would have the table reading on the stage. And as David mentioned, after the reading, we would go page by page, and everyone was invited to offer their suggestions. Then they would spend the rest of the day rehearsing. And after they would, you know, block out a scene, we would come over and we would watch it. And we did our rewrites in the mess tent. We basically sat in the mess tent, you know, the two or three of us and and did the rewrite. And I would say, would you get that guy with the ladle out of here? He's bothering me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get that guy with the cream yeah. weenies, please. The guy yeah. with the the cream Step away from it. the mess tent. <laughs> so, so then the, the script gets printed. And for the next three days, 
the show is is filmed. Usually, um, one of the three days was out at the ranch, out at the Malibu ranch, and they would be shooting in the summer from dawn till dusk. And um, after four days and the show was filmed, we we would begin another one. But meanwhile, that show would go to editing. And back in those days, you edited on film. So they would edit and then we would go and see a rough cut and everyone would offer suggestions and they would go back and re-edit it. And then it would go through the process of color balancing and, you know, adding sound and adding voices in the background and things like that and credits and music. And we would see one last final version of it. And then it would go to CBS. Hmm. And that was it. Every week. Every week. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. That's incredible. It's a lot of damn work. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for 25 episodes, yeah. we had to do that 25 times. Yeah. Well, you know what they say about writing in television or running a show, you know, the money's great, but you spend it at Cedar Sinai. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Looking back, is there a, a particular scene or even a particular line that you are proud of? Wow. I would say from our very first episode that we wrote called Out of Sight, Out of Mind. Mm-hmm. We have a speech where Hawkeye talks about what it is like being blind. Something fascinating has been happening to me. What's that, Hawkeye? One part of the world is closed down for me, but another part is opened up. Sure, I, I, I keep picturing myself sitting on a corner with a tin cup selling thermometers, but I'm going through something here I didn't expect. This morning I spent two incredible hours listening to that, that rainstorm. And I, and I didn't just hear it. I was part of it. I bet you have no idea that, that rain hitting the ground makes the same sound as steaks when they're barbecuing. Or that thunder seems to echo forever. And you wouldn't believe what, how funny it is to hear somebody slip and fall in the mud. I, it had to be burned. Beach, this is full of trapdoors, but I, I, I think there may almost be some kind of advantage in this. And it wasn't in the outline. But we just thought, you know, there's no moment here where Hawkeye expresses what he's going through. So let's put it in and they can always take it out if they don't want it. And we must have spent like three, four days writing and rewriting. It's it's like all on napkins and and things (laughs) when, when we're in restaurants and, you know, and Alan does a masterful job of delivering that speech. And the speech that he gives is word for word, the speech that we wrote. Really? And so that that's that would be my all-time favorite speech. Wow. Yeah, I, I would agree. A lot of stuff I love that we did, but that was our first show we wrote. And it was, um, it was such a degree of difficulty on that for us uh, that literally we walked around blind a couple of hours. <laughs> Good. Led yeah. around Benedict Canyon by our agent. Well, we both had blinders on to just try to feel what it was like or sense it. Really? And we had help wow. from one of the featured actors in the show, Tom Sullivan, who talked a lot about being oh, he yeah. was blind, if you yeah. remember. Mm-hmm. Sure. And, and, but it just took us forever to write that oh, speech. Gosh. And we were always like, is it lyrical? Does it yeah. have the right sounds? And, but then you get Alan to do it and you go, yeah, well, that was pretty good. Yeah. yeah. What a beautiful instrument to, to hand it to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Alan what Alba. a great way to say that. Yeah. I hear people talk about writers. Well, some some people are good at stories. Some people are good at jokes. Some people are this. How, how does that work? What what does that really mean? Somebody's go well. It's a this is a better idea for the story if somebody does this, and then somebody else comes in and says, well, it'll be funnier if he does that. How does how does that break down? Well, if somebody's good at story and somebody's good at a joke, well, you know that really comes more into play. I think on multi camera shows where you know you see run throughs every day and then go back to the office and and rewrite you know there are certain writers who are just very quick very funny in a room and pitch great jokes they might not necessarily write scripts with tremendous amount of depth and you may have other writers who are very good at story and solving story problems who are kind of quiet and not really comfortable in that room type situation. You know, Neil Simon would not be all that comfortable 
just pitching jokes as opposed to Mel Brooks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's like, it's like ball players, you know, where there are some that have certain strengths and then you have some ball players who are five tool players, you know, Mm -hmm. who are good in a room and write good drafts and come up with good stories and bathe. (laughs) I'd say it's an acquired (laughs) skill, too. It it takes a while to get the feel for how to tell a story. There are people, as as Ken said, there are people who are just multi-talented, or as I used the Magic Johnson analogy before, you know, it just sees the court in a way that other people don't. So there's a certain, you have a certain genius for looking at it, and most of us don't. So it's, it's a matter of practice. A lot of it is just doing it again and again and again and again until you start to get confident and you you know what to look for. We need a place here where we're telling the audience what this is about, and then then we can hook that on. And you know all those kind of things. You don't know that when you start. You have to learn that. You learn it by putting a, a tape recorder up to Mary Tyler Moore. Exactly. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right. And by doing it, and by making yeah. mistakes. Right. Yeah. And going back to the room and cutting things out, and sort of learning. Oh, this is what we need to do. Yeah. You do have like epiphanies along the way and you go, oh, I get it now. (laughs) Just like it comes to you. You just don't sweat it anymore. You don't sweat certain things anymore. I'll get that. I just have to look for this. Okay. When I find this, then I'll know what this is. And Mm -hmm. and that's, that's process. I mean, I'll watch a show, a sitcom, obviously a very young staff and the storytelling will be very klutzy. And I'll think to myself, I see what they're trying to do. I know what they want to do here, but they're trying to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. if they had somebody who had done this before, you know, a Gene Reynolds to say, no, 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 guys, that's not how you do it. If Yeah, I see what you want to say. Here's the way to say it. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what Gene was great at as well. Mm -hmm. Was there ever a a MASH episode or a scene or something that you just uh, kind of sticks in your craw and you go, gee, I wish I hadn't done it that way or. (laughs) Love another crack at that. (laughs) Yeah, I want to do that. Can we shoot that again? I don't watch it much of anything where I wouldn't go back and change one thing or another thing. Hmm. Right. Or just going like, what were we thinking when we did that? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) what were you thinking? Yeah. Yeah. I always go back now and I, and I go, give me one more day. Yeah. Give me one more day with that script. Ah, uh, gosh. That's what wow. I teach. Uh, I, I, if I, if I can try to leave students that, you know, can teach us too. And the one thing, we, you know, we try to tell them is, you know, don't get precious about these things. You know, when you write them, they'll always change and you can always make them better. That's a thing that young people have to learn too, that there's a craft to it. You never really quite finish. Mm -hmm. You have to turn it in. It has to be shot, but you could always look at it and go, could have been better there. There's a few times you hit it out of the park. You go, I wouldn't change a word of this, but that's more rare than than common. And it's so funny. You're you're the writers and that's what you're feeling. And I'm sure actors do and direct, everybody does, but an audience doesn't feel that. They're looking at something and they're just, you know, it's delicious for them. Yeah. Well, they don't live with it the same way we do. Either. Yeah. Yeah. No, in fact, they, I mean, there are times when, you know, I'd be watching an episode of MASH and I'd be making notes on <laughs> make this edit. And I think we could do this. And I realize, oh, wait, no. Oh, wait. <laughs> it's over the air. It's going yeah. over the air. <laughs> and then your wife takes your hand and puts you to bed and says, you go, go to yeah. bed, Ken. Yeah. You uh, you mentioned teaching young people about writing. We had a listener recently send us a message. His name is Philip Raven. Mm-hmm. He didn't even know that we were going to be talking to you. He just wanted us to know that he is an English teacher who uses MASH to teach short story structure. In fact, the episode he uses is None Like It Hot. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. <laughs> That's one of those ones I think I would have gone back on. A <laughs> See but there? I'll take it. I'll you take can take it. Philip's class and he can teach you. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm sure he, I, I wish I had. I wish I had his name as mine. That's a great writing. Yeah, name. isn't that a great name? <laughs> but uh, no, that's great. I mean, it's wonderful to have some residual effect that way. Gentlemen, you have been more than gracious with your time. I have one more quick question. and I have six a- more quick questions, so go ahead. No. <laughs> Go ahead, Ryan. I have one more question for you. You know, looking back now, MASH has been off the air for 38 years and uh, next year, the 50th anniversary of the pilot episode, but it's still as popular today as it was back then. Why does MASH still matter? You know, it was so unique in that it's such an existential dilemma 
where you have doctors whose mission is to save lives in a situation where the goal is to kill as many people as possible and how they deal with that you know in a in a humorous way i think is universal and i also think the fact that it's a, a period piece you know that it's set in the 1950s so people aren't distracted by wide lapels and <laughs> leather jackets and leisure suits and things like that when they watch it and i think because it's it's single camera it, it's beautiful to look at you know, there's outdoors, it's green, there's, uh, I, I think, for all those reasons, uh, it's it's very inviting. The theme song oh, I, yes. is something that uh, is a big factor. I was, was going to say that, that's great. I mean, there's such a comfort level when the show starts and you hear that theme mm-hmm. and you want to settle in. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. We had a costumer, Jeff, you remember Albert Frankel? Yes, indeed. Remember Albert? Yes. Mm-hmm. Ken's talking about the timelessness of the situation and, and what the people wore. Uh, and Albert was, you know, he had, he was kind of a fuss budget and he would, you know, <laughs> worked hard at what he did, but he would come up to our office and he would you know in his german accent he said we have a problem this week we all it's winter and we have to see we have so many things how many things do you want us to do and he would leave and we just sit there and go this guy's got the easiest costuming job in the world <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what are you what are you coming up here <laughs> put him in green you yeah crazy bastard. Put him in green yeah i gonna <laughs> i'll never forget that just like we'd be sitting there going why are we Spending 10 minutes on this. That's funny. Sybil Shepherd would have killed him. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, Albert was and, great. You know, he was a sweet guy, but he'd get all worked up. Anyway, to sum up, I think, and it's true for what we've been through in the last year, I think, all of us cooked up and watching things like what happened on January 6th and the election itself and the this sort of madness of of the whole situation. And to me, the theme always of the show and one that we kept in the back of our minds was, if you could sum up MASH in one sentence, it was, if I don't go mad, I'll go mad. Mm. It was that. It was that sense of humanity and reacting to the madness around you, even if it's not quite as heightened as that, that I think is a theme that, for me anyway, continues to resonate. And and I think that's why a lot of people find it relevant and strangely contemporary. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a hundred other reasons why it was great from the cast to the writing to the uh, subject matter. But I think that has a kind of human resonance that only MASH had. Mm-hmm. Comedy was a defense mechanism. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, how many other sitcoms yeah. can say that? Hey, guys. Thank you. If you have any last uh, wonderful things you'd like to tell any, you might tell a secret that we don't know about MASH? No, I would just say thanks so much to, to everybody who's still watching and loving the show. You know, when you write a show 40 years ago, uh, you know, we expected it to be on CBS, you know, Monday night in three weeks, and then it was going to rerun and maybe be in syndication for three, four years. You know, we never dreamed that it would still be so beloved some 40 years later. So thank you so much for continuing to watch. Couldn't have said it better. And that's why I'm partners with that. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think the relationship's going to last. Personally, I think it's going to (laughs) last. Oh, thank you. Could break any time now. (laughs) Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, guys. Great questions. Great. Great fun. Thank you. Thanks. Our thanks to Ken Levine and David Isaacs for their time and their talent. I have enjoyed watching the episodes they've written for many, many years. Not just MASH, but Cheers and Frasier. And oh my gosh, these guys have written a little bit of everything. And if any of these shows have ever made you laugh, it's because of Ken and David's writing. So thank you. Thank you for that. They're terrific. It was wonderful to talk to both of them. I haven't spoken to them in years. Although certainly, as Ken mentioned, he does have a great blog. And if anybody has nothing to do or you have something to do, you should go read his blog because it's really terrific. Yes. Again, I I agree. I laughed at the shows that they wrote and will continue to laugh at those shows because they're terrific, funny, and those are two really talented writers. And we will put a link to Ken's blog and a link to Ken's podcast also in the show notes for this episode. And we'll put a link where you can order balloons from David's Balloon Shop. Yes, and a link to... (laughs) 
<laughs> also a link to, uh, I think, Ken's uh, bank rooting number. Uh, that'll help some of you. So good luck to you out there. We would like to say thank you to our Patreon VIPs, Jeff. Private Richard Hamilton. Private Matthew Booth. Private Joseph Fosco. Corporal Dago Punk. Cor- <laughs> Is that real? Oh, Dago Punk? Really? Okay. (laughs) Captain Leighton Worthy. Captain Brandon Weatherford. Major Alan Iverson. And Major Kerry Gajowski. Thank you for signing up to be VIPs at Patreon and supporting the show. You too can support the show for as little as $3 a month. And you can unlock some really cool rewards. Just go to mashmatters.com slash support couple of things here. First of all, uh, I do want to point out that I, I'm pretty sure that Major Allen Iverson is not the Allen Iverson who was the professional basketball player. Allen spells his name a little bit differently. If it is, he can sure pony up the three bucks a month. I mean, really. <laughs> Come on, Allen. And yes, Corporal Dago Punk is somebody we also mentioned. Dago Punk is uh, an artist. She is the one who sent us some lovely gifts. Yes. These little trading cards of uh, some original artwork of of the MASH cast that are really, really cool. And we'll put a link where you can find those and actually where you can uh, purchase those as well. We don't we don't get a cut unless, you know, unless Dago Punk wants to give us a cut. But, you know, <laughs> we'll have our uh, lawyers get in touch with Dago Punk's yeah, lawyer. We're going to lawyer up We'll Dago, get all so, of that uh, figured Punk. out. Yeah, we'll get all the details <laughs> ironed out. But uh, yeah, we'll put a link to those in the show notes here for this episode, episode 62 at mashmatters.com. Yeah, it's those cards were so terrific. They're, they're her artwork of all of the uh, cast of MASH. And on the back of the cards are some funny little sayings. So she did a great job. Terrific artist. She's terrific. You can find us online, mashmatters.com. You can also uh, find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. We're everywhere, Jeff. You, we're like a fungus. You just cannot get rid of us. <laughs> kind of like mushrooms or something, yeah. aren't we? <laughs> like dandelions. They just, we just yeah. keep popping up. Yeah. <laughs> you try to pluck us and get us out of your life, and we're back. <laughs> you can't yeah, escape you're dead, us. pal. That's yeah. it. You can also call and leave a voicemail under three minutes in length at 513-436-4077, or you can send us an email, mashmatterspodcast at gmail.com. If you want to leave a message longer than five minutes, here's Ryan's uh, personal phone number, 657 Wait, 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 wait. No? There may be some creditors listening out there. Oh, all right. Thank you for listening. Until next time, here's looking up your old address. 